Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of the China Global Sharp Power Speaker Series. Today, we have a very interesting event. Um, the first effort of its kind around the world to document the extent of Chinese influence using data collection by local subject matter experts. The China Index was an initiative launched by DoubleThink Labs and Puma Shen in particular, who assembled a team that I was very privileged to be a part of that developed 99 indicators to measure China influence around the world. We've assembled some of those individuals who did data collection and analysis of different regions around the world to talk to you today about the project and its findings. Puma Shen is an associate professor at National Taipei University, the chairperson of DoubleThink Lab and vice president of the Taiwan Association for Human Rights. His publications analyze Chinese influence, information operations in Taiwan and the US, and he's now investigating United Front activities uh, in Taiwan and Southeast Asia. Didi Kirsten Tatlow is a senior reporter for international affairs at Newsweek. She has reported for the Hong Kong Standard, the Associated Press, and the New York Times, and was a senior fellow at the German Council on Foreign Relations. In 2021, she co-edited an excellent volume entitled China's Quest for Foreign Technology Beyond Espionage. Parsifal de Solo Alvarado is the founder and executive director of the Andres Bello Foundation in Bogota, Colombia. He is a non-resident senior fellow in the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub and acted as Chinese foreign policy advisor to the foreign affairs minister of the interim government of Venezuela from 2019 to 2020. And finally, the Honorable Tina Tin Kidashelli chairs Civic Idea, a think tank fighting the Soviet legacy in Georgia, confronting Russian propaganda and advocating for sound defense and security policy. She served as the first female Minister of Defense of Georgia. I look forward to the conversation and discussion. And for those of you in our audience, I encourage you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens to log questions. There will be audience Q&A towards the end of the program. Puma, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Let me share my PowerPoint real quick. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for, for hosting all this. And thanks, Glenn, for organizing this. I think it is my pleasure to introduce the findings of the China Index, which like measures the Chinese influence worldwide. So people always like curious about how we could define the China's influence. So instead of like using a theory or describe the Chinese influence, our approach is more bottom up. So what we did is like this. We tried to mapping like all these like Chinese influence operation, like in, in theory or in practice, and did a, a literature review to list all kinds of Chinese like influence operations introduced by scholars and try to categorize them into different domains. And in the end, we have this. We have media, academia, society, economy, technology, domestic politics, foreign policy, and uh, military and law enforcement. And each domain consists of 11 indicators, so which means that we have 99 total indicators to measure the Chinese influence. And this cannot be done by the index committee, and Glenn is also here to help us to develop all these 99 questions. And also we have the, all these regional partners that help us in each country find the local partners that could help us answering all these questions. So with all these domain indicators combined here, we actually right now have an overall ranking for the 82 countries. Uh, the top three most influential countries are Pakistan and Cambodia and Singapore. And but however, I think it is worth noting that China might highly influence the country in domain A, but not in domain B. So in this regard, I think it is better to look into the ranking in each domain one at a time. So if you look at this, I mean, in terms of academia, United States has been deeply influenced in this field of academia. But if you look into like technology, the US is not that effective. So all this, like the overall ranking only tells us a partial story. So by digging into all this, like what all these domain scores tell us, uh, we could learn like how China deploys its efforts. 
So for example, China prefers to build up ideology when a targeted country has experienced a history of Chinese diaspora or maybe Chinese students. So using a Chinese diaspora as a leverage, China could easily infiltrate or invest in media companies like host cultural events and use Chinese students to gain some power academically. So if a researcher wants to focus on whether China is trying to establish an ideology in a particular country, we suggest that we could look into the domain like media, academia, and society on the far left. And the top country in terms of all these ideological influence is actually Taiwan, which is not surprising. And what happens when building all this ideology could be very difficult, especially with the language barrier. So the answer relates to another strategy China loves to deploy is the dependence approach. This approach is much straightforward. It is about China trying to build economic relationships with other countries. And when dependence has been established, China uses it as a leverage again to provoke the targeted country. Selling and exporting technology to the targeted country also works. And it's the famous approach, the China Standard 2035. So this dependence approach can also be built politically while China tries to reach politicians and ultimately bribe them. So if one wants to focus on whether China is building this kind of dependence on specific countries, uh, we could check the domains like the economy, technology, and domestic politics. The country at the top in this dependence category is Pakistan, and followed by uh, South Africa and Philippines. And the end game of all these kind of Chinese influence is the so-called rule making, which contrasts the Western rule of law. So China wants to create a Chinese paradigm or like Team China. This includes like forcing other countries to adopt the same foreign policy as China and having some military drills together or even allow Chinese law enforcement into targeted countries. So in this regard, I mean, if a researcher wants to focus on whether China implements Chinese rules in a particular country, we suggest to look into the military, foreign policy and law enforcement. So the top one for Chinese rule making is Cambodia, followed by Pakistan and Thailand and Thailand. So, I mean, in summary, it's like a different focus would change a country's ranking enormously. And we, we could also look into the regional difference. And um, but I don't I, I don't think I have time to dig into the regional. But as you can see here, like different region actually has some different effects and some region has some more effects in technology and some uh, region has more effects in academia it really depends by region by region but we also suggest that maybe we could have another criteria or divider to categorize all this country in addition to all this like regional focus to geopolitics so uh in the end here i want to introduce how we this uh, de uh design all these uh 1990 indicators so the way we design all these indicators is not that random. So for example, we try to conceptualize Chinese influence using three different layers, exposure, pressure, and effects. So we measure exposure, pressure, and effects in each domain. For example, for the 11 indicators in the media domain, we ask whether the media is invested in by China. That's the exposure question. Or whether the journalists are threatened by China, that's the pressure question. Or whether the media reports align with Chinese propaganda, and that's the effect. So the hypothesis here is that if a country is more exposed to China, the effects of Chinese influence are higher. And if China pressures the country, the impact of Chinese influence is higher as well. But according to our statistical, uh, statistical analysis, the former uh, seems to be right. When we got more exposure, you got more connections with China, there's, there are more effects could be seen, but not the latter. So it means that imposing pressure is ineffective and sometimes more pressure even correlates with fewer effects. And, and also we want to talk about whether we could predict the future trend of the Chinese influence because we're going to update this kind of index uh, nearly. So we really need to see what's the trajectory of that. So by comparing our data to, the, uh, to other indicators that I mean, generated by other organizations, we found some interesting results here. So first is the PRC imports. It, the data actually highly correlates with our ranking. The more imports from China, the more influence we see in our index. So to look into this, we checked the AEI Chinese investment scores and found that investment scores correlate with the domains such as 
science, media, and academia. We can then conclude that China is investing in media and academia. However, we can say that the investment by China looks like a practical approach that can predict Chinese influence. And some researchers suggest that the size of the Chinese diaspora might be uh, and also a predictor of the media infiltration. However, it is not valid according to our statistical analysis. And on the other hand, the number of Chinese students actually is relatively stronger predictor that contributes to the Chinese influence in academia. But we need to be careful about that because it only means that there's a correlation in our statistical analysis. And sometimes we also need to see that all these Chinese students might be the victims of the Chinese influence. Or they are not actually the leverage over there. And also because we mentioned that the pressure is most likely not a good strategy for China since it backfires. So some predictors are strongly correlated with the pressure indicators. So for example, we see more pressure from China for other countries when there are more Chinese international students in these countries. More pressure can be seen when the GDP is high. And most importantly, less corruption leads to more pressure. And more pressure, however, could also backfire because more pressure leads to less favorability for China. So these are our preliminary findings and all data is still open. You can download it whether you, I mean, whenever you want. And we're going to do our best to update this index newly to trace there's, if there's any chronological trajectories. So I think that pretty ends my presentation. And I'll talk about maybe different dividers, how can we categorize all these countries, maybe during the Q&A. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Puma. Um, for those of you in the audience, the report is downloadable from the website with an explanation of the data and methodology. But to get into some of the geographies and the specific findings now, we're going to turn to our other guests. First, Didi Kirsten Tatlow. Didi, take it away. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and again, also, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very pleased to be here. And thanks for organizing this great event. You know, um, when I started to research Germany, for double think lab, um, China in the World Index. Um, I realized, as I think many other people did, just how much information was missing from our knowledge. Um, anyone who's dealt into this area of CCP influence activities overseas will be very familiar with this kind of lament, but we haven't got enough research, we don't know enough. I think it's still the case. Um, and as a way of sort of um, illustrating that, I want to um, just explain a little bit about how much how much needed to be done i mean basic research such as what is the communist party of china's activities in germany the ones that we tend not to see because they're done quietly they're done by the party they're done through networks which are not public um had not been done here in germany despite the breadth and depth of the uh, chinese german relationship which is described officially as being you know for many years it was sort of a strategic relationship, as, as the German government likes to say. It didn't, honestly didn't sound terribly strategic to me to be missing out such large, massive chunks of information activity that China was doing in Germany. But so I set about trying to figure out what was going on and came up with the count working with a researcher of at least 190 groups directly affiliated to the United Front. And I mean, in a formal sense, not in a kind of do something together occasional sense, but in a formal sense, 190 in Germany. Um, another 40 were part of a nationwide German network of, of sort of China culture friendly groups. Germans that have been sort of taken in, scooped up if you like, and we're now part of um, also of similar activities. Um, 80 China Student Scholar Association, CSSAs run out and connected to consulates around the country and um, about 20 Confucius Institutes. So you get there and then add on the China aid centers active in Germany. And now they've been proven to be involved also in the harassment of, um, of overseas Chinese living in Germany. Often uh, people who don't agree with the Communist Party, that's sometimes why they're here, um, actually very, very active harassment, bomb threat, uh, police involved, at least five of those. Um, so we're looking at, you know, over 330 organization in Germany. Now, the one thing that really struck me, and then I'll get on to the extra specifics of the index in a second, was that, you know, I think any analysis of German-Chinese relations that does not take into account the activities of the Communist Party 
of the Communist Party of China and Germany that are highlighted in this uh, index are any such analysis is simply not helpful because it is so wide off the mark of what's actually going on here. Yet many such analyses exist. And in fact, they still to this day, I would argue, fear and inform public debate about uh, China-German relations. So immensely important to drill down as um, Puma and his team are doing um, on, this, on this issue. I think um, on specifics in terms of, of um, what I then discovered for the index, well, uh, if you go into uh, the actual website on Double Think Lab, um, it says uh, correctly that the ranking Germany has in the this index of 82 countries is 19. And if you look at the that lovely chart that's a bit like a spider's web underneath it there, you'll see um, the visuals are very telling. A very red patch stretches far out towards academia, this, this sort of subdivision issue of how much influence is there in academia. Um, and there's a very good reason for that. German research is, is uh, heavily um, populated by PRC researchers, most of whom work in the science and technology area. And we have an enormous amount of technology outflow to China, and that's been happening for decades from Germany. Um, a very short story to illustrate that when the Liaoning trade delegation from the province of Liaoning in, in China arrived in Germany in January this year, COVID, COVID lifting in China, trade delegations are out networking. Um, they rather demanded to go to DZ, which is a, a high physics laboratory up in the north of Germany. Um, and they were politely told, why would a trade delegation want to go to a high physics laboratory? And they were told, they were told by the, the German side, they were told by the Chinese side, well, because there are so many PRC researchers working there, which is, of course, true. There are some very high-level research institutes in Germany where, where there are entire teams um, of people from the PRC, which is not necessarily, as we all know per se, necessarily a problem. However, given what they're researching, it's almost certain that they come under pressure to share by all uh, means possible, by all methods, the fruits of those research. So specifically, again, um, getting back into the index, another area I'd like to point out that was very heavily um, influenced by the CCP, according to the criteria we have, was domestic politics in Germany. And I would say that's down to uh, the issue of um, elite capture. There are certain organizations in Germany, such as the uh, Kina Brücke, the China Bridge, which is highly active, which took as its counterpart in China, Wang Chen, who used to be of the Central Committee member of the Communist Party, as a Politburo member, is also vice president, a vice chairman, if you like, of the um, NPC, the National People's Congress. And that meant that he had a counterpart in Germany called Hans Peter Friedrich, who was also a vice chairperson of the Bundestag. And they set up this Kinaproka, which most members are anonymous. And this type of uh, elite capture, if you like, very, very high level then spreads throughout politics. It's enormously effective. And we, we sort of saw that mirrored in many places, but also because this is Germany and the state's issue is very important. It's a, very, it's a federal country. This, was, this, this situation is happening in many, many at the federal level in the major states, Bavaria, baden württemberg um, North Rhine-Westphalia, et cetera. Um, very briefly, I don't want to take up too much time. Very briefly, the last point then, Business. Now, um, the economy was an interesting one with Germany in the index. And I think that if you look at the spider's web of, of where the red color shows where the influence was the greatest from the CCP, according to our criteria, all the 99 questions that we filled in to answer this index for each country, um, the economy is sort of a little bit surprisingly low, if you like. And the reason for that is that, of course, the German Chinese business relationship is enormous. Um, it, it really is very, very large or wide and deep, as they like to say here, uh, in many levels. However, there are good reasons why it didn't seem quite that way uh, in, the, in the index. And that would be that some of the questions asked, some of the questions posed, which worked for the world, were perhaps slightly different in their impact in Germany. 
in terms of the answers that they produced. And that I would then single out issues like how much of your country's sovereign debt is owned by China. Well, that's not going to be really relevant to Germany. Um, or for example, how much of your country's extractive industries are owned by PRC companies. Again, highly industrialized nation like Germany, that doesn't really hit home. So I think that that part of the index um, sort of speaks to a different set of questions, if you like, rather than um, rather than delivering a finite answer. And of course, this is a project that we need as it goes forward. So I'll finish right there because there's a lot more to say, but I don't want to take up others' time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Didi. I think that points to a crucial uh, question here, and that is, you know, each country's engaged with China in slightly different and unique ways, um, very much on their own terms. So turning now to South America, Parsifal, tell us what you found. Hmm. Thank you, Glenn, and that was to, to everyone and, and to all the listeners. Uh, so but I, I would like to start with a couple of caveats, even though probably most of you are already aware of these. Um, nonetheless, I, I think they're worth highlighting. Uh, and the first of all, and I think it's related to Didi's last point, is that, uh, well, a data doesn't live in a vacuum, it has to be interpreted. Um, odds are that if a Chinese researcher from the Beijing Academy of Social Sciences uh, interprets a China index data sheet, uh, she would probably, you know, come to very different conclusions than the ones, you know, I as, uh, as a Venezuelan researcher uh, uh, came up with. So. I think it's 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 very important to take into account to to read the, these results with a, a a grain of salt, and to always try to look at it from a local perspective, uh, and how that refers to a, a larger regional framework and then in a, in, in a global framework. Um, that being said, in in the case of the China index, this is given its wide scope. This is very difficult. So some uh, uh, indicators might not represent the reality as, 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 as Didi mentioned, uh, but well, that's the whole point of, of, of the, the project to be able to normalize and to draw some broad conclusions in regards to Chinese uh, influence uh, at a global level, but also at a, a local level. Um, so it's it's very important to use the proper framing, the proper premises when re reading these results uh, in order to avoid, you know, uh, um, you know, th this will obviously lead to off the mark conclusions. Um, well, and now uh, digging into South America specifically. So we're talking about 10 countries. Um, uh, the first thing I'd like to point out is that if you look at the at the global map of the index, South America, with the exception of of Guyana and uh, Suriname, is it has been completely covered. And, and when you compare it to Africa, uh, there's a lot of missing countries. So. Um, that cut that was one of the first things that caught my attention, and and one of the things I I, I talked with uh, with the um, Double Thing Lab and some of their lead researchers, and I think this speaks a lot to um, the a the available expertise within regions to carry out this kind of work, and two. Uh, because one of the prerequisites to participate in the project was basically not to have any official links or receive uh, funding from the PRC or PRC affiliated um, um, organizations. So uh, as I've been told in the case of Africa, this was quite difficult. Uh, and it's something that you know the, the Double Think Lab has been working on. And the way we managed to get around this, because the problem did uh, present itself uh, in the first iteration of the index, you know, not being able to find, you know, people with the, the enough expertise to carry out the work, was to 
uh, rely on a strong foundation of investigative journalism that exists in Latin America. So this, uh, the way we approached the project was um, using tools from the investigative journalism toolkit instead of China expertise. And uh, this led, in, in, in our view, led to uh, very good results. Uh, but this is precisely because there is such a strong foundation in within the region uh, because of many reasons, well, co a common language being one of them, common culture, a common set of problems uh, in terms of institutions. And these are the kinds of, of, of activities that usually journalists you know, cover in the region. And speaking specifically about the data, um, I'd like you to, you know, if there's some points uh, uh, that are worth highlighting that, you know, take uh, with you as food for thought is that, well, several. The first one is that South America, when you look at, when you put it in, uh, when you frame it uh, within the, the, the global index, is very standard with uh, a few exceptions. So most of the countries are um, across categories. They tend to be across the middle uh, uh, when you come, regardless of the category. Obviously, there are some exceptions, but if you do a median average, South America uh, is not, uh, is, is a, it's more or less across the middle. It's not on the lower uh, a part of the, the, the um, influence index or uh, in, in, in the top. There are two important exceptions are Colombia and Paraguay. And this is what, one of the reasons why I made my initial comments in terms of you know, knowing, having local and regional expertise to be able to interpret this data is that, well, Paraguay is sort of, uh, it's, it's an easy answer because it doesn't have official relations with the PRC. Um, and uh, uh, most of the, the, the correlations that Puma talked about in the beginning, uh, given the lack of economic engagement with the PRC primarily, uh, these, uh, this, the, the side effects tends to be uh, lower, lower influence or lower effect from, from uh, be it Chinese uh, participation or Chinese influence in general. The case of Colombia is quite interesting um, because it's sort of a late comer when it comes to engagement between China and Latin America more broadly. Um, and there's two important um, aspects to Colombia. One, it's its own uh, uh, history. It's uh, according to some of the research that we've done in the country, there's a lot of negative perceptions in the PRC vis-a-vis -vis Colombia, given its, its uh, um, uh, um, internal struggle history with uh, the uh, drug trafficking and uh, uh, the whole peace process that has been developing over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, that would be a first, uh, which has in, can be read as a... Uh, uh, a negative perception that the not only the Chinese government but Chinese businesses have towards the country that has played a role in the decision to get involved. That would be a first. And the second one it would be Colombia's own relation with the United States. Uh, Colombia has been a traditional key uh, uh, supporter of U.S. foreign policy and most of uh, the countries domestic issues and foreign policy have been uh, highly influenced by the United States and they correlate in a lot of, of, of their um, of their foreign policy. So when you take those two into account, it's uh, it kind of explains why China, why Colombia is in the bottom where, when you look at the Latin America, uh, uh, Latin American countries, but overall is still very pretty, pretty low. Um, and another point I'd like to point out uh, is that uh, stemming from Puma's um, comments at the beginning, uh, when the, the, the divisions of 
how to interpret uh, the different categories when you talk about rulemaking. Out of the 10 countries uh, that are in South America um, it, within the index, it, among the top three categories, foreign policy is present in nine out of the 10. Uh, and this makes a lot of sense because given South America's a geographical location, proximity to the US, when you look at Chinese foreign policy objectives at a global level, and uh, talking about the global South in particular, the kinds of, uh, uh, the kind of influence the PRC tries to exert varies very uh, much with a countries in its close proximity, B, the West, and C, particular, the United States. So the kind of, of interests vary. And given that foreign policy is, is, is way up there, uh, this goes in line with China's um, pursuit of getting a lot of countries in the global South to A, not uh, uh, interfere in China's so-called internal affairs, uh, uh, vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Xinjiang, and this kind of topics that, that um, are uh, highly delicate to the PRC and the Communist Party. So um, it comes as, as no surprise to us that foreign policy is way up there in the index in South America, because uh, when, you, when you look at diplomatic engagement and um, the kind of activities carried at a, at a high level between China and the different countries across the region, they usually are framed across um, getting these countries, A, not to criticize, to criticize China internationally, uh, and B, to vote in regional organizations or global organizations such as the UN in correlation with the uh, with the PRC, so if there's something that 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 that, that popped out to us, it's definitely uh, that one of the main interests of the PRC in the region is obviously economy. The, the economy is, is 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 has a high ranking as well, but it's more about uh, getting global South countries to align their foreign policy with Chinese interests, particularly not criticizing internationally and vying for Chinese interests when the topic comes, you know, becomes a, a global topic such as Taiwan and Hong Kong. I'll, I'll leave it at that so we have enough time for, for Q&A. Thank you very much, Parseval. Now we're going to pivot over to a region of the world that looks a little bit different in that it really is a hot spot for China influence, Russia influence, and U.S. competition. And so, again, this is a little bit of, uh, of how unique um, that region of the world is. Tina, over to you, please. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for having me in this very interesting conversation. And thank you to Puma and Double Think Lab for initiating these wonderful projects that brought us together. Um, well, there are certain uh, uh, patterns when we talk about the, uh, first of all, to define what we, region we are talking about. This is the South Caucasus and Central Asia. My organization was in charge of uh, researching and writing about. Uh, we did a couple of other countries as well, but uh, in this presentation, I will concentrate mainly on the um, eight, well, seven, unfortunately, um, it, it is still impossible to do any uh, quality work in Turkmenistan. But um, other than that, uh, I will concentrate on the seven countries of the region that we did research uh, and uh, tried to analyze. Um, from start, it is to be said that uh, Almost with little differences, none of those countries are democracies. Why it is important is that when we talk about collection of data and researching the data, it is not always like in Germany or in other European countries that you actually have an access to the first hand information. And uh, something that was mentioned here already um, by Parsifal about the journalistic investigation was very much the most important tool in our work because it takes lots of 
uh, lots of efforts and um, uh, several attempts to get uh, to sets and information necessary for this research. Because of that, I believe uh, that uh, parts that are related, particularly with national security, defense, military affairs, might be uh, much deeper, much problematic than it looks in the index right now. Because again, that's the information that which has the biggest secrecy uh, around it and uh, uh, we are, it's very difficult to to access actual actual data. So that's uh, that needs to be remembered when we look at this um, at this index. And probably it's not true only for the Central Asian countries, but also it is true for lots of countries in the world. Probably some countries in South America as well, and definitely I believe in Africa that uh, some data might be missing. Uh, uh, missing um, re uh, very important information due to the fact that secrecy is very high. The the other problem, the other issue that was uh, that became pretty clear for us uh, while doing this um, this study was a pattern that we found in um, in in my region. Um, basically, uh, looking back, uh, everything that we uh, we found in Central Asia was repeated and used in South Caucasus countries later on by China. The movement of Chinese companies, Chinese universities, um, I don't know, tech companies, anything that is done by, by China in those countries starts in most of the cases in Kazakhstan and then moves from there all the way to Georgia. And it's like a playbook. If you if you research properly uh, Central Asian countries, then you basically know what's gonna happen tomorrow in Georgia or Armenia or a very China relationship. Third, um, as it was already said, it is true for, for this region as well that countries differ, obviously. You do not have uh, the same um, level of uh, influence or interference or um, or uh, even pressure um, in all seven countries. Um, as closer you get to China, uh, it gets more, but it's not obviously only depending on the geography. There are other factors as well that um, make lots of uh, difference in, in that part of the world. Uh, the um, And one of them, uh, obviously, one of the very important critical moments and probably also in terms of the timing of the research was the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, that particular moment uh, gave us lots of um, insight and lots of responses to the interviews were coming on, on Tajikistan having border and Chinese involvement, influence, uh, engagement, increased engagement in Tajikistan exactly because of that reason. Um, and at the same time, uh, when you look at the military uh, cooperation or military affairs, then Tajikistan comes on top of the list. This is probably why when Puma showed us this first slide, you could see Tajikistan on top of those uh, five or seven countries. Uh, the dominant factor there is a, a very uh, clear and uh, strong uh, military and uh, defense cooperation, cooperation generally speaking in security field. Um, the fourth point I wanted to mention is about the foreign policy, which is extremely important for my region, as Glenn already mentioned. It's kind of a big battlefield of, of two crossing big power influences, Russia and China, and obviously European Union and United States playing uh, its role, positive role, um, exercising such a level of soft power in those countries as well. And because of the still dominant, well, before Ukraine aggression, uh, dominant and, and the research was done mainly at that time. Uh, the uh, Russian dominance was clearly visible. Uh, Russia was still present in most of the foreign policy, in most of the security agenda issues, not that much in business and economy, but when it comes to foreign policy, state affairs, um, security issues, then Russia had a very dominant position. It is to be mentioned that as we are in the process of uh, restarting this work and renewing the countries, I'm pretty sure that in, in my case, at least in case of Central Asia and South Caucasus, we will have a huge difference because of the effects of uh, the uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine uh, and, uh, uh, the countries in this region 
sort of searching alternative loyalties and shifting their loyalties uh, to China from Russia. That was very, uh, uh, to be said clearly, very visible when we were doing the first stage of this research. At that time, Russia still was a very dominant power in, in the region when it came to foreign affairs. So uh, when you look, for example, at the voting in international organizations, let's say UN voting, um, there is a huge difference that we had a year ago, year and a half ago, and we have right now. Uh, when if before uh, most of those uh, votes would, except for my country, actually, that's where I can clearly say that except for Georgia, most of those countries would go along with Russia's decision, Russia's vote, Russia's preferences. And now it is shifting towards Chinese vote, Chinese preferences. So let's say on Ukraine vote, when you have Russia and some um, countries, not many, but still some countries voting against all the uh, resolutions um, supporting Ukraine, uh, you have uh, Central Asian countries and Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan mainly abstaining like China does and not necessarily going again in line with, with Russia anymore. Um, when, when it comes to, um, uh, to business and economy parts of the research, um, again, uh, companies are almost the same. Uh, you do not have that much of a difference uh, of uh, who is coming to the region, who is interested in the region, uh, who does what kind of work, and also what what are the uh, relations and um, strategies used towards the state? Uh, Didi mentioned um, elite capture, and that's an issue I cannot uh, miss here because that's a very big deal in the region. Elite capture is probably one of the most defining uh, character of Chinese and those countries bilateral cooperation. Um, I can speak for my country, which is probably, which looks like the least influenced. Um, if you look at the uh, research done so far, if you look at different police papers written so far, you will see this, uh, if you see the grades, if you see the uh, index numbers, then Georgia will come the last. But in reality, when it comes to elite capture, for example, probably we are in the worst war situation. For the first time, we have a government, we have a prime minister who is an officially Chinese man in Georgian government, uh, similar to what we had before in, in Czech Republic in the face of the president of Czech, Czech Republic. The guy used to work for um, very famous, not for the good reasons, Chinese company CFC uh, for a while. And uh, uh, he was um, serving as an advisor after that. And if you look at the files, he's being a prime minister, he's still listed under the CFC, uh, CFC files. Well, obviously it's not the case anymore, but technically speaking, he did not even uh, bother to remove his name from, from all those papers. And uh, since he, he came to power, you see increased, um, increased um, participation of, the, um, uh, of China, uh, widely speaking, in Georgia, being it in academia, at the university level, at the academy of sciences level, being it in, in uh, state procurement. I can tell you with uh, absolute uh, uh, confidence that uh, there is no single bid in a country that is over 100 million uh, where any other company than Chinese has a chance of winning. And that's been the case since uh, since the current prime minister came to power. Uh, and he, and after he came, uh, first he came as a minister of defense. And when he became the minister of defense, he brought Chinese companies to the minister of defense as well. If before we were saying that at least on that part, on the security and defense part, uh, Georgia was immune and was very different in a region. Uh, now that's not the case anymore either. Uh, so we are in this, um, a puzzle uh, on the one hand going to NATO and having strategic military cooperation with the United States, and at the same time, at the same time, Chinese companies starting their activities in uh, with the Georgian military on a small scale so far, but it is it has started uh, again exactly at the time when current Prime Minister was working as a Minister of Defense. Uh, so. Um, now we there is a very interesting moment if we if we move to another country uh, in uh, Kazakhstan because with the new president and the new parliamentary elections 
a lot is changing. Not that much towards China, more towards Russia, but when if you see significant change towards Russia in the region, then it automatically means that there is a change of policy towards China as well. Because those countries, unfortunately, are still in a condition and in under the um under the um belief that uh, uh, they need a patron, they need someone bigger to protect and to secure uh, their not even well-being, but generally, even more generally speaking, their being, their existence at state, as a state. And uh, just the last point, when when we were watching the uh, uh, the meeting of um, of um, Shanghai Cooperation Council in, in Uzbekistan, all of that was there. All the deals were, were cut, uh, regardless of the fact that Putin was, Mr. President Putin was present, still, um, still uh, um, it was absolutely clear who was in charge and who was the boss in Evo. And uh, and obviously um, it's uh, he, then Xi Jinping's visit to, to Kazakhstan, separate from, from Uzbekistan also proved the case that uh, he is, uh, he's searching for those ties, he's strengthening those ties and he's trying to, uh, to have those countries wandering around after, uh, after the collapse of Russia as we knew it, uh, and obviously it is still to come with their defeat in Ukraine, uh, Xi Jinping is making all those smart choices and smart moves for uh, ensuring those loyalties lie with China. So I'll stop here and uh, happy to answer any questions and uh, comments. Thank you, Tina. For those in the audience, I encourage you to post questions to the Q&A, and I'm going to get started pulling a few of those questions for the group here. Uh, and uh, and we'll see if we can um, take the discussion any further. Let me start with Puma uh, first. Um, the question was asked, why were some countries selected for coverage in the index and why are others not represented? Could you tell us a little bit about um, how those choices were made and, and the future iterations of the index? Yeah, because uh, sometimes it's really hard to find a local partner and uh, just like a uh, possible state, because sometimes e even like you find a partner or some sort of experts, but they actually receive fundings from China. So that would be excluded from us. And some of the local partners, I mean, they participate in the survey, but disappear along the way. So that's why there are some countries are still not covered. And it's extremely difficult right now to find more local experts in Africa. But luckily, I think we have found some this year. So hopefully, because I think we're going to have more than 110 country this year. So uh, hopefully we could see like more trajectory, trajectories around the way. That's right. And data will be updated for countries that you've already covered in the original iteration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So this is an ongoing exercise. Um, I was wondering if, and I invite all of you to, to um, participate in the answer to this question, um, which, uniform, universal, global trends that you identified across your different geographies, and in particular, if you want to pull one or two unique regional or local factors, because I think Tina pointed out that China does a lot of learning um, from one space that it then applies to other geographies. So what are the things that China has learned that you have seen that are that are common and then unique? Let's start with Puma. You can give us a global perspective, and then I invite the others to uh, to join in. Yeah, so I think I'll be brief, but uh, I think uh, I would say like two or three years ago, China really focused a lot on economy, like try to use it as a leverage to, I mean, have more influence all around the world. But actually, you could see that the economic power actually is waning. And for the part, I mean, it's just my hypothesis, but for the part that the economic is waning, that they don't have enough power, they're using more and more like war, warrior-like foreign policy to compensate that. So which means that still they're, they're trying to use some leverage or dependence power, like I mentioned before. But right now, because they don't have enough resources, they have to use foreign policy to compensate that. And another thing is that they're also using technology all around the world. For example, I think in Europe is a perfect case that they're using technology as a power to do to have more leverage over there. And I surmise, I mean, it's another, also another case here in Taiwan, because 
uh, since that they don't have enough enough uh, power, especially economic power, to persuade、mm. their own public, saying that hey, the CCP is the best choice for them. Means that they're having to use ideology approach to persuade their own citizens that China is the like great power right now around the world, and that will really backfire, I think.、Mm-hmm. Others, TD. Yeah.、Um, thanks. I think you know I would reinforce what Huma just said about technology. You'll see in the Germany survey index that I did. That technology is also one of the areas where there was a lot of、uh, influence, and we talked about. I think I, I addressed that when I talked about the situation with Germany. Of course, this relates to the industrial strength of Germany and also to the growing industrial strength of China and the upgrade in quality that we're seeing in China and the desire to sort of over overtake Germany, if you like. I think not just Germany, but Europe or generally in the West. More generally,、um, these very specific industries outlined in several plans, latest being the fourteen five year plan.、Um, I'd like to address, however, a question that I see in the Q and A from Norbert Holtkamp,、uh, who says that the federal policy on China is not enforced in the German research infrastructure universities. Correct, it's not, but the、um, You know the German research infrastructure, so the the system of research institutes which are outside of universities, of which there are very very many scores、um, for major systems, perhaps in total hundreds of such research institutes.、Um, they are a constituent part of Germany's relationship with China. So Norbert, I see this as working the other way round, that it produces a certain type of pressure. Toward the government to behave in a certain way, so that's why it's so important. And I think also,、um, you know, left to the states and the individual institutions to implement in a way they see fit. The question continues: as long as that's the case, there's no way to better manage the intellectual property outflux. I'd actually disagree with that. I think there are a lot of better ways to manage the intellectual property outflux, and I think that.、Um, One way is that the、uh, the federal state, the federal government rather, does indeed have to connect much more closely to states and、uh, make a much clearer case for why it really matters to、um, protect very very valuable intellectual property, which is after all the result of enormous investment into Germany by German society itself and the EU, of course. And you know, in a longer term way, the U.S. with this sort of background of security support, which has really sustained Germany since 1945,、um, I think that that these points are absolutely crucial. And we do have a lot of new ways. We do have a lot of ways in which we can better manage、um, technology transfer and unwanted and intellectual property outflow. So I just wanted to make that point. I think it's extremely important. Thanks, Tina. I see that you've unmuted. Yeah. yeah, I just uh, wanted to um, uh, to stress on the points that Fuma mentioned.、Um, the the,、um, the lesson that we've learned,、um, particularly in the region, is and also looking at the data from from other countries、uh, in China index, is that、um, definitely there is a shift from pure economic cooperation to everything else, including military cooperation, and that theory or. Uh, the、uh, idea that China comes just with the economy, with the money, and with businesses, and that's it, and everything else goes、uh, the old way is not the case anymore.、Um, and again, um, uh, as I was designed, I was、um, designated to talk about the region. I will bring examples from the region mainly. The、um, With the diminishing power of Russia,、um, it is even more visible now than than ever. And、um, This um, this um, um, hard power、um, interference is already seen in the face of even a military base that exists, a Chinese military base that exists in in Tajikistan. Although they deny, they call、uh, different names, different、um, things, but in reality, it is、uh, a full functioning military base. And I would say that in exactly the same context, we can talk about this. 
whole police station ideas that is now um, clear and discovered almost all over the world and not just in, in my region, including in Europe, in, in Canada, in, in other countries. We are again, um, Chinese move uh, uh, different otherwise than just by economic tools. And uh, the second lesson I think they learned, but not from their own experience that much, uh, is from the um, uh, soft power activities of the West in in after the breakup of the Soviet Union in the former republics was uh, the uh, all movement and activities in academia. So you see almost uh, duplicated programs that used to be run by American universities or US State Department in our countries. Uh, but obviously with a completely different ideology and without the free speech and without the uh, possibility of free discussion. It is relevant in uh, both ways uh, in the countries we are uh, those programs are implemented on the basis base of local universities and also in China when they take the uh, students to China on, on various stipends and scholarships. Um, and then once they come back, uh, you see that influence moving into the media as well. And different from the standard, for example, Kremlin run propaganda tools. In this case, it's very, um, uh, these are very legitimate instruments and these are like genuine instruments. These are not run by Chinese companies or Chinese media. You do not have, at least in these parts of the world, you do not have anything close to Sputnik, which is, or, or Russia Today, which is a Kremlin run media source. But you have locally established media outlets by the alumni of those various Chinese universities. And, and they are the locals, uh, Kazakhs, Georgians, Armenians, uh, Tajiks are running those outlets as a genuine local um, uh, media uh, resource. And, uh, and because of that, they gain more credibility and they are more legitimate than if there is something labeled directly as a Chinese uh, Communist Party run media outlet or something. And uh, finally, to answer the first question you asked uh, and to agree with what Puma said, particularly in my region, there is a huge uh, lack of the expertise amongst the independent uh, players in NGO sector or amongst the journalists. It is uh, for objective reasons because the, the, the area was so dominated by Russia that all expertise goes to Russia, like everybody for for years, for decades, was work, decades were, were working on Russia and there is not that much a human resource left for it, but but it is starting. Now we are getting more and more people interested in it and more and more young people interested, both in uh, on the media side as well as uh, young researchers and uh, scholars who who do more and more job on on China. and uh, and I believe the China index is playing a very uh, interesting role in in all of that. I think all of you point to a critical factor here, and that is the role of civil society in either substituting for China expertise or supplementing China expertise and bringing to the attention um, factors that, that are really at stake in your own countries um, that matter tremendously. And it, it can't be emphasized enough that this is not just an academic problem, that this is a lived problem. That, um, that individuals, for reasons of ensuring that their local governments are accountable to their people, uh, ensuring that, um, that they have control over their own societies, that their stories are told fairly and accurately, all of this is critical. It is much more than just a foreign policy or military issue. Um, and the China Index has been critical there. I want to ask across your different geographies, because it is often said that China is moving into a vacuum that was left by the retreat of the United States and traditional European powers from the world. Uh, and China is exploiting that space. Um, to what extent do you think that fairly describes the areas that you covered? I, I expect Germany is a little bit different. It has a different relationship to the United States, but that could be the counter example. And so, um, you know, is there a policy response that, that or a set of solutions that one could prescribe that says that, the US State Department or the British Foreign Office or, or Germany or Japan um, should do more in these regions of the world to compete uh, against China, uh, to crowd out China, or is China actually 
competing effectively with them in those spaces and winning in some instances. Over to you, who wants to take a first stab at that? Mm, if, uh, if, if I may, Glenn, um, um, well, uh, related to your, your, your question, there's a couple of other questions in the, in the chat that I think are related uh, and also apply to, to Latin America as a whole. So these are both from Victor Haynes. Uh, the first one is, to what extent, if measured, has the Belt and Road Initiative enhanced PRC influence in countries involved? And uh, the second one is, is there a similar index to be found measuring the United States influence as compared to the PRC? Um, so the second question, I, uh, I wish there was, um, uh, because uh, usually... You know, the if you read the headlines, it's, it's as you mentioned, Glenn, that the U.S. Uh, you know stepping aside or leaving a vacuum, and China stepping in to fill the void. Um, and I think this is true to an extent, but it's way more complex than just U.S. you know pulling out or paying less attention or fo focusing its foreign policy in Southeast Asia, Middle East, or or. In this, uh, well, in the, in the current context, in 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 Europe and and Russia, so um, uh, commenting on the first question, has the Belt and Road Initiative enhanced PRC influence? This is not represented specifically uh, in the index, but you can read uh, uh, the data uh, and compare it to the countries that uh, have become uh, uh, members of the Belt and Road. I think, if I'm not mistaken, already 19 Latin American countries have signed on to the initiative, uh, give or take one or one country I might be missing. Um, uh, but we haven't seen it's like you have you do have an optic in terms of Chinese participation in these countries when they sign on to, and this is part of how these negotiations uh, uh, um, play out. Uh, it's important to point out that these are MOUs. Uh, you know, being part of the uh, the Belt and Road Initiative doesn't imply any sort of responsibilities by the 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 uh, by the countries themselves. So there's no um, um, official alignment or official uh, uh, policies that is stemmed from this. It's just basically uh, a a public way of saying, look, we're, we're willing to work uh, with China. And from the Chinese perspective, it's, it's a basically part of its global PR campaign of saying, look, this is the amount of countries that we work with. It's, it's more, I would say, a public relations, you know, global campaign. That's something that has specific impact on the countries themselves. Uh, in Latin America, if you look at most countries, again, it's an uptick. Uh, when the, the 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 MOUs are signed, and then things just continue the the trend that before signing, be it usually it's it's uh, it's an uptrend, but again we don't see any sort of correlation between being part of the Belt and Road and greater Chinese engagement. And talking specifically about the region and and, and the future trends that I think are represented in the data is uh, uh, as, as, as Didi and, and, uh, and Tina mentioned is aspect of technology. In Latin America, there are two important uh, industrial hubs, Mexico and Brazil. These are the two industrial nations of the region, um, but very different to what we would say about Germany as an industrial nation. These are countries that usually import technology. They don't, the, they don't have vast R&D investments. It's mostly importing technology and assembling and, and uh, uh, functioning as industrial uh, manufacturing hubs. So when you look at the index, so uh, Brazil is, uh, it's quite interesting. Let me look it up just one second. So in technology, it is uh, it, it has 61.4 percent, which is almost you know 21 points above the the global average. Uh, but when you see Mexico, 
it is uh, even below the, it's 36.4%, so four points below the global average. And the, I think this speaks to what we, I was mentioning at the beginning, that we shouldn't underestimate US influence. Uh, the my Again, this, this is my own reading on the data. The main reason why we see this discrepancy is because uh, of Mexico's own relationship with the US and US's own relationship with China. So a lot of the sanctions on Chinese companies get uh, translated onto Mexico because of its close economic relationship. Uh, but do we do not see that happening in Brazil, basically because Brazil is a much more independent country uh, in its economic policy in comparison to Mexico and the United States. Didi. Yeah, I uh, wanted to address the issue of, for example, what the US could slash should be doing about this shifting strategic moment that we are now in. Um, one thing that really occurs to me is the issue of transparency in countries that are in the index and the desire of people locally to know more about what uh, is going on, what the PRC might be doing, what in the case of Georgia, what Russia might be doing, etc. These are absolutely vital uh, an absolutely vital ingredient, I would say. And I think, Glenn, that picks up on your point about the importance of civil society, which, of course, is intimately linked to democracy. It's in a very, very, a lot, a lot that can be done there, I think, through a more targeted focus, a greater effort, if you like, from more kinds of people in the EU could play a huge role there, too. I also want to pick up on something that Terry Tracy has put in the uh, questions. Why is economic leverage waning as a major tool of PRC influence? And I agree that it is. And I agree with the others who, who pointed to the growth of a harder nosed kind of political pressure. Puma started by making that point um, earlier. And, you know, of course, the answer lies in China to a certain extent that, that China is bringing in new policies, new laws, new attitudes turning inwards to a certain extent, setting up a kind of a parallel domestic and global kind of economy, uh, the steel circulation concept. Um, what I see in Germany among manufacturers, and often they're not the huge ones, not the Siemens, the Bosch, et cetera, but the so-called Mittelstand, the smaller ones, is that they believe that in order to survive in China now and to flourish, they need to do what they call enter the Chinese economic ecosystem. They have to mm -hmm. signify, essentially. And this is something that many of them are prepared to do at this point, or some of them are prepared to do, quite a lot of them, because they don't really have much of a choice. They're quite deeply invested there at this point, but that will have an impact. That's not, that's going to go somewhere. That's not the end of that story. And I wonder how well that's going to go. Um, but I wanted to get back to the political thing very briefly. I noticed recently that, um, that um, when Le, Emmanuel Macron made his trip to China just recently and, and caused great headlines with his comments about, about, um, about the US and China and Europe's position somehow as a third pole um, in, this, in this great power situation, that he said he drew a parallel between uh, the European Union not wanting the European Union to break up and China not wanting to be broken up with Taiwan, etc. Now, I thought this was a very specious and a very or rather silly parallel, actually. But I wondered why, because why he was making it, because just previously, a Spanish, a very senior Spanish official made exactly the same parallel. So immediately, I think that's a talking point. Come from China, how is it getting into Europe? How did that happen? And I think these are the, precisely the kinds of issues that we really need to investigate. They're deeply political and they're real evidence of a real political intervention. I think of interference. I mean, you could say, okay, intervention, you could say, well, this is, you know, influence, et cetera. Um, if the Europeans are silly enough to kind of, you know, buy these arguments, then then we need to kind of get our own house in order. And, and that's all, of course, true. But the very, very final point, what is the goal of all of this seen from Germany? Well, I think that um, the goal is very clear. It's to set up something called the Eurasian you know, Integration Network, which will essentially separate um, Europe away from the US. It'll kind of like prize it away like that, slowly, slowly, slowly. You have this vast Eurasian trading continent 
and America off somewhere doing its own thing. You know, that would be the final goal. Just a few points there about what could be the long term impact or goal of, of all this activity. I've heard you say in the past, TD, that that in many ways Germany is you win over Germany, you win Europe is the Chinese strategy. And that's a brilliant example that you um, that you surfaced on Spain. Um, what are the odds there? Right. So mm -hmm. I want to ask now that now that we have surfaced this data, all of you through your very hard work and we've collected it, aggregated it and begun to analyze it. How has it been received in the geographies that you've covered? Um, how have have people said, well, thank you very much, but I don't see any problem here, or are people alarmed, uh, or some mixture of, of reactions across the spectrum? Um, it looks like Parsifal. Go ahead. Mm, uh, uh, sure. So the, the index hasn't uh, garnered that much uh, media attention, mm -hmm. um, and I think this is, it, it's, it's, it, it is to be expected. So China, when, when you talk about China uh, across the region, I'm generalizing here, but usually what you get is a, uh, a, a, a neutral to a positive view vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, because China is represents economic opportunity. It represents in, uh, foreign direct investment. Um, so uh, when we look at the 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 few um, yeah, media uh, um, uh, comments on the index, uh, they tend to be very neutral. Uh, they 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 actually we we don't contrary to uh, some uh, some articles I've seen in Europe and the United States concerning the index, which are very very critical, um, uh, particularly because. These are usually people aligned with with PRC interests, but their attack usually is related to this is a you know U.S. funded or Taiwan funded or this is a very Western view of of China, uh, but that hasn't been the case in Latin America, which I think speaks to that neutrality that most countries seem to uh, um, uh, frame China around. So. I think that's that's quite interesting, and it's very different because, as as uh, we've all seen from the other presentations, it's the situation is quite different if you're in Europe or if you're in Southeast Asia, and especially if you're in Taiwan. Right, right. Would others like to comment on how it's been received in their region, and in particular, what action has come out of it? Tina. Uh, very briefly, um, just to continue, um, it also it's not. Um, it also depends on the um, uh, audience or the target group who we are talking about, because uh, in, in our case, uh, it's pattern with the media is almost the same. You do not have that much of an interest in media to the index per se, but we have its use uh, by uh, various journalists uh, uh, when it comes to broadcasting on concrete topics, then they use uh, certain slides or certain data from the index. So they don't necessarily um, report on the index itself, but they use index for other reporting, which is, I think, the whole idea of having a tool like this. Uh, but uh, when it comes to other groups, uh, for example, uh, the same researchers, and I've mentioned in my previous intervention that uh, in increased interest towards China, China index played also its role. It is true, uh, more and more uh, young people are asking feedback about it, are asking how it was done and whether it's a reliable data or not, whether they can use it in their research, uh, they can use it in their papers that they are writing. So it's kind of, mm, it, uh, it, it depends. It depends which what groups we are talking about. When it comes to government, in these parts of the world, governments uh, tend to ignore issues like this. It does not mean they are not worried. It does not mean they are not interested. Uh, but they publicly they they ignore it. They never talk about about it as long as uh, it's not uh, directly affecting their concrete policy. And in this case, obviously, uh, we don't have that. Um, so yeah, 
I think that uh, uh, to certain level, the um, at least at this stage, China index played its role because it's it is used uh, uh, very interestingly by media for for their own reporting purposes, whatever they they report on, and uh, and I think that's that's serving the case. I want to give Puma the final word here um, and give us a preview of new directions that you might be taking the China index to what we can expect in the year or two ahead from this work. Um, Thanks. Uh, also, I just want to add an interesting point is that when we uh, released the beta of the China index, I think it's like, like more than a year ago, uh, China actually react and say, reacted and saying that uh, thanks for double think that help us mapping all their influence all around the world, which means that they are kind of proud of it. So that's the that's the perception actually from China. And also, I mean, in Taiwan, there are like also, I mean, some players thinking that, hey, this is uh, pretty good. It actually help us like know how uh, China not infiltrate, but how great China is and how they influence all around the world. And also back to one of the question, because I know there are like lots of questions in the, in, in the Q&A &A session, but there's another one that I have often been asked is that whether we uh, should have an index for the U.S., right? So, I mean, from the standpoint of Taiwan, because uh, the U.S. didn't, I mean, doesn't really claim that Taiwan is part of U.S., but China is claiming that Taiwan is part of China. So that's why we care China more. But the other thing is that uh, there is no United Front Work Department over there in the U.S., so which could make it a little more a little bit more difficult for us to compare. But I think uh, we still welcome that if someone who have the resources, I think it's possible that we, we can have another 99 like, top questions that has been asked that could measure the influence uh, from the US. And we could, I, I think that one of the goal for us to have this China index is that sometimes we kind of over estimate the, the power of China, but sometimes we underestimate. So with this kind of index, we could at least have some objective standard that could help us to talk about um, China, Chinese influence operation. And then without exaggerating it, but without like downplaying it, and everyone could be on the same page. But we also know that there are like so many factors that could not be measured. So for example, we have the neighborhood leaders that has been that will be elected here in our neighborhood and they are so infiltrated by China. But we didn't put that question into this indicators because in other countries they don't have this kind of neighborhood leaders. So qualitative studies could still be very important. With all this quantitative data, I mean if we could have some more field work, more studies and interviews that could put it on it, I mean, underneath all each country's report. I think that would help us a lot. I mean, understand what's the real Chinese influence. And we really hope that with uh, the new data from uh, this year, 2022 to 2023, we could predict and see what kind of uh, trajectory we have. And then we could, again, update the index to everyone. Thank you. I want to commend everyone on this panel for the hard work that they've done for the vision and in particular for the longitudinal possibilities and the increasing transparency and in making more data available on this very important topic, which many of us have, have worked on in different ways. Um, I want to thank our audience for joining us too. Uh, if you all have been wondering about TikTok and the concerns raised about Chinese firms, data collection and national security, then our next event is tailor-made for you. One week from today on Tuesday, April 18th, we'll be rolling out a major new CGSP report by visiting fellow Dr. Matt Johnson entitled China's Grand Strategy for Global Data Dominance, and you won't want to miss that. Thank you, Puma, Didi, Parsifal, and Tina. It's been a pleasure having you, and I look forward to uh, engaging further with you in future iterations of the China uh, Index Project. Thank you to the audience. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks.